Hey friends, welcome back. This is part two of Burgundy, the easiest, hardest wine region. And today we are going to talk about why is Burgundy considered a difficult wine region to learn. And so we're going to get right into it. Um, so in the first part, uh, in part one, we talked about the grapes. And so the grapes of Burgundy are very straightforward. We're really concentrating on Chardonnay for the white and Pinot Noir for the red. Um, but the geography is why Burgundy can be a challenge. Um, as I mentioned in part one, the geography and terroir, meaning the sense of place, the sense of the land coming through in the wine, um, it's super important in Burgundy. So to understand this on a fundamental level, I'm going to make a comparison between arguably another the other great red wine region um, of France, which would be Bordeaux, because it's done differently there um, in terms of assessing quality. So in Bordeaux, you let's say you have a great chateau that is known for making amazing wine. If they acquire more vineyards that are within their appellation, it doesn't matter about the land per se. It's the house, the chateau, and the winemakers that confer that quality onto that land. So it's just assumed that whatever land they buy up with whatever vines is going to make great wine because they make great wine. So the difference is in Burgundy that it's the plots of land plus the winemaker who owns those parcels that confers the quality onto that wine. So for that is why when you're looking at a bottle of Burgundy, the more information and the more specific we're going to get right down to the very parcel of the vineyard, that is what is going to um, be desirable and say, like, it's because these particular vines on this particular patch owned by this particular winemaker makes this a great wine. And so that's what I mean when I say, like, the terroir is largely what is going to say, hey, this is an amazing wine because of this one or two rows of vines even owned by this winemaker. Um, so that comes down to um, laws. Um, I'm not going to get too much into this history in this class, but um, it was basically that like, you know, uh, somebody died, they pass on the land, it got split up and split up and split up and split up. And so then you end up with these really small parcels of land um, within Burgundy. Um, so we're going to go to the map and I'm going to share this with you since I've talked so much about why this is important. Okay. So we're going to go to our just our big um, overview here. Um, Actually, no, we're going to go back. That's not what I wanted to share. I wanted to go to the bigger view of France first. All right. So we're back in Burgundy here. And the reason I wanted to take a step back is because I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, where this lay in the greater terms of France um, and how far away Chablis is again, because that's where we're going to start this time. Um, so as we can see... Burgundy's over here. Chablis is this pink bit up here. This is the greater part of um, the mass of Burgundy and Beaujolais, which we also know is part of Burgundy, but it's its own thing. Um, and the river here. Okay, so remember this because it's going to be important when I go back to what I was originally doing. All right. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so remember that pink blob in the upper left? That's Chablis. Now it's green. Okay. Chablis is its own appellation and it is known for uh, crisp white mineral driven Chardonnay. Get some aligote here, but that is the style of Chablis. So if someone says I like a Chablis, what they mean is I like a crisp mineral driven white wine. Great. Easy peasy. Let's move on to the harder bit. Up here in the north, we have the city of Dijon. 
Um, and you see here, it says the Côte de Nuit. Côte de Nuit means the slope of the night. Um, a good way to remember this, or at least one way that my brain remembers this is uh, Nuit in French means the night. And uh, it is known for red wines. So if you associate the nighttime with darkness and think of darker wines, it is known for its red wine. Um, the Côte de Nuit is also known not only for the red wines, but for the very priciest, spendiest, spendiest Pinot Noir uh, from Burgundy. They are very, very famous. They are age-worthy and they are highly sought after. Um, red wine here accounts for 80% of the production. And of the 33 Grand Cru, now remember Grand Cru is the highest designation, um, 24 of the 33 are coming from the Côte de Nuit. Now, I know it could be panic inducing to see all these names, all these little tiny names. Don't worry about that. Um, unless you're going for your master sommelier exam or your master of wine, you don't need to uh, memorize these. Don't worry about it. Um, but I think it, it is important to know that Cote de Nuit, famous for its uh, red wines made from Pinot Noir that are age worthy. Uh, they have some type of cherry expression and red fruit expression. You get earthiness and mushroom notes um, and intensity and usually the higher end some new oak usage. Now let's move a little bit south. You see this other bold area is the Côte de Bun. Now that means the slope of Bun, which is a town. Bun is a town. And down here, though they make all the different styles of wine, you get red, you get red, white, and everything. This is the area that's more known for white wine. So if we're thinking about the home base of oaky Chardonnay and the style that was then mimicked across the world as a form of flattery and homage to oaky Chardonnay. This is where that wine style is from. Um, you can get um, the best expressions are going to have orchard fruit like uh, apple and pear, hazelnuts. They're full bodied, they're opulent and lush. They can be tropical and have sort of uh, baking spice notes from the new oak in the previous uh, video, I also talked about um, the other things that give the Chardonnay its richness, which would be uh, allowing a full or partial malolactic fermentation, lees aging, meaning aging the wine on the dead yeast to give it a creamier texture, plus oak. <clears throat> so there are eight Grand Cru vineyards within the Côte de Bone. Seven of the eight of them are for white wine. So you get the sense that like up here, we're known for red. Down here, we're known for white. Of course, you're gonna get everything. People might make all white wine and then bottle one red. Um, people have, you know, little projects. They own some holdings. Like I said, you're gonna have, if you're a winemaker in Burgundy, you're gonna have little parcels spread all throughout for the most part. Now, these two regions, the Côte de Nuit and the Côte de Bonne, make up what we call the Côte d'Or, which means the golden slope. Okay, so this northern pink part is the Côte d'Or, which we see here. All right. If we're about to move southward, this is the Côte Chalonnais, and that's this purple bit here. And Another good way to remember this is that though, again, moving south, um, not as known for being as fancy, maybe not as well known as the wines up in the north here, but again, you're going to get more of that um, Pinot Noir production, more red wines uh, here. So it's kind of easy to remember you have um, red, white, red, white back down here in the south. So it's just an easy way to think from north to south in terms of what these regions are known for. So you're gonna get uh, value-driven Pinot Noir in the Côte Chalonnaise and um, also Cremant. Um, Cremant, which we know is um, champagne method sparkling wine. It can be either white or rosé. Um, and there, there is Cremant de Bourgogne. So a lot of production from here, um, particularly from the town of Rui, that's R-U-L-L-Y. Uh, so if you see that, it's going to be a high quality Cremant de Bourgogne from here. 
And also the only appellation for the grape Aligote, which I mentioned in the previous video, it's a white grape, um, and that is Bouzeron. Bouzeron is, um, as you can see here where my cursor is, is an appellation just for Aligote. So that's just a fun little outlier to know. And moving further south, uh, we have Macon in the Macone, that's M-A-C-O-N for Macon. Um, and as I mentioned before, more whites again. So we have red, white, red, white moving south. Um, or if you include Chablis, we're talking white, red, <laughs> white, red, white. Um, the Maconnais, as we're getting warmer here, we're getting noticeably warmer in terms of um, like harvest dates can be up to two to three weeks different from the north to south. Um, so that's how much the environment and the warmth is affecting the ripeness of those grapes. And as we know, the warmth contributes to the ripeness of the grapes and therefore the sugar. And so down here, known for white uh, wine production again, and because of that, that ripeness goes more away from orchard fruit and more into leaning into the tropical flavors. So um, more of those honeyed banana, uh, rich expression of Chardonnay that we get when it's in a warmer climate. Earlier, I mentioned the terms Grand Cru. Grand Cru, Cru is the top layer of Appalachians and it accounts for only 1% of the production and all of it comes from the Cote d'Or. Okay, this is all of our Grand Cru sites are all in the north up here. 10% of production are Premier Cru sites. If it says it, it's gonna say it on the bottle. If, a, if someone has a site that is a, a designated Premier Cru, it is going to say it on the bottle, okay? You will see it there. There are 640 Premier Cru sites, and this is why I do not care if you memorize them. Don't worry about it. Way too much to memorize. In fact, I was just chatting with a winemaker last week and we were talking about this video and he said, oh yeah, forget it. It's just, there's too many, it's too complicated. So, you know, and like I said, unless you're going for one of the higher up tests, don't worry, uh, stressing your brain about it. 37% of production can use um, village appellations, meaning that the village um, can claim the designation to be listed on the label because it produces a wine of a certain style. Bouzeron will be one of them. Uh, Merceau, known for um, super famous rich Chardonnays, is another example. It can say Merceau on the label. That's a village. Um, and then more than half of our production is just regional wine production. That means just like Bourgogne Rouge, Bourgogne Blanc, meaning burgundy white, burgundy red. And those grapes can come from anywhere in here, or uh, that also includes Cremant de Bourgogne, meaning it can come from anywhere in here. Now, it wouldn't be French Appalachian systems if there weren't exceptions. And our exception here would be Chablis. In Chablis, um, starting at the top, we have Grand Cru again. Fun little thing there is that though I mentioned before that Chardonnay from Chablis is known for being unoaked, racy, and mineral driven, Grand Cru Chablis will often use some new oak. So it will taste different than the rest of Chablis. If you have the opportunity to try them, I highly encourage it. They're delicious. Um, but they are almost, even though they're the top arguable wines of Chablis, they don't represent what Chablis really tastes like for the in the grander scheme of things. Then we have our Premier Cru Chablis. Then you have a uh, Petite Chablis, which is outside. Uh, and then you just have Chablis. And finally, since I've been blabbing a lot, um, because these labels can be so tricksy and difficult to understand, um, if you see on a bottle, Grand Vin de Bourgogne, that does not mean Grand Cru. Uh, it just means a great wine of Burgundy. Um, so don't be fooled. But a good rule of thumb is that the more specific information is on a label, very likely the more high end of the bottle is going to be 
from Burgundy. And what I mean by that is instead of just saying this is Burgundy, we're saying this is the village. This is a premier crew appellation. This is a grand crew appellation, meaning a teeny tiny little plot of land. And because of that, because of the rarity, people pour their resources into making sure that those wines are exceptional. Those vines are well taken care of. Both um, the grapes are taken care of both in the vineyard and then at the winery. And so generally speaking, the more close to the top of the pyramid you get, um, the, uh, the higher quality the wine is going to be and therefore the spendier it's going to be. Um, but there are great values to be had at the village level. Um, so take a look at your wine lists. Um, from what I've said today, try to, you know, decode the label and put some of this um, information to use. And um, I hope this was helpful in the easiest, hardest uh, wine region of France, in my opinion. Um, all right. Good luck. Message me if you have any questions and I'll talk to you soon.